Alright guys, today I'm going to show you a video game that I occasionally play and how I use strategy to beat it. This is going to be semi-important and relevant to trading uh, because it's going to go over how strategy can win and how to you have to find an edge and have a good strategy in order to win. So, I'm going to turn down the volume in this a little bit so that it's not too disruptive and I'm going to briefly explain, exp ugh, sorry, I'm going to briefly explain the premise of this game. There's a chat right here, just I can chat with my teammates. So each team has five players. I chose this hero, Ragnaros, that's my username, that's their username. Here is the player list, our hero and our username. This is my team, this is their team. Ordinarily, this team has a big advantage. I'm going to tell you why. There's different types of heroes in this game. They, they kind of get categorized into different classes. There's tanks, bruisers, assassins, uh, and healers, basically. There's also support, which is kind of a type of healer that's not quite as good, but uh, they have more specific utilities. But basically what it boils down to is tanks, bruisers, assassins, and healers. The general, the general team composition that you do is one tank, one bruiser, two assassins, and a healer. That's what they have here. They have a tank, a bruiser, two assassins, and a healer. The role of the tank is they are the engage. There's a thing called Fog of War. It's not exclusive to this game. It exists in many MOBA games and RTS games. Fog of War is, and you know, it's a real life term. It's just out of your vision. This dark area is Fog of War. Neither team can see this. This is a replay so I can see the enemy team, but when I'm actually in the game playing it, I can only see my character's vision, my structure's vision, and my teammate's vision. So I won't know where the enemy players are unless they're in our vision. There's also things called bushes. Depending on the map design, they look different, but on this map they look like little air vents with clouds. that are like steam coming out of them, I guess. Basically, the, the implication is that you can't see someone who's in this bush. You can only see an enemy player in this bush if you have an ability that reveals them, or if you step into that bush with them. Bushes are highly effective areas in order for teams to hide and set up an ambush, which is a real military tactic. I'm sure many of you guys know what an ambush is. It's pretty kind of self-explanatory. Everyone knows what it is. Um, an ambush is one of the most effective ways to get it to kill, although it's difficult to coordinate and set up one if your players aren't good. There's a lot of not good players in this game, so you have to be very inventive with how to win a, a game of this. You have a core, and the enemy team has a core. The objective of the game is to destroy the enemy enemy's core. It's actually not to kill enemy players. Killing enemy players is one of the more effective ways to eventually get to killing their core because killing their enemy players will give you experience and make your team stronger, give you an edge over the team because you will get to the next level. This is the team's level right now. We all start off at level one. The highest a team can get to is level 30. Generally, the highest you see a team get to in a game is somewhere in the 20s. Sometimes it doesn't even get that far. There's multiple ways to win. Well, there's only one way to win, which is kill the core. But there's multiple ways to try to approach that. But what's important is that this core cannot take damage until a keep has been destroyed. So we have to destroy a keep in order to get to the core. Usually multiple keeps to make it easier. You can't really get to a keep until you've destroyed a fort. These, four, these three outer ones are forts. The inner ones are keeps. Every 30 seconds a minion wave pushes from our core and from their core. They meet in the middle of each lane and fight. A less impactful but more efficient way to get experience than killing forts or enemy players is to kill the waves of minions that are controlled by computers. We can't control them, they just automatically fight. If you kill those waves, you won't get as much experience as a kill on an enemy player, but it's usually safer. Because if you engage in a fight with the enemy team, it's risky. You can die and end up actually giving them experience instead of taking experience, or you know what I mean, getting experience. So, as I was saying, the role of the tank is to engage with the enemy team. They set up the ambushes and stuff like that. The bruiser is like a smaller tank. He has less health than a tank, but does more damage. He can also assist in ambushing. The assassins have the least health, but they do the most damage. The healer doesn't do much damage at all, but he can heal, he can give them health back with his abilities. 
Each player or hero has generally three to four abilities that they use, and they have various cooldowns. They're usually going to be between two and ten second cooldowns on each ability. They also have mana, which determines whether or not they're able to use abilities. They have a health bar, and then they have a mana bar. They use too much mana, they have to use this well to get more mana, which has a cooldown, or they have to go back to their base and get mana and health. That's just so that you have to manage your abilities and mana properly, so you can't just keep spamming abilities. You have to actually be smart about how you're using your mana, because if you spend it all, you'll have to go back, leave the fight for a bit, and get it all back, so that before you can continue fighting. But there are also multiple methods, including this, on the battlefield to get a little bit of mana. Anyway, I'm going to play the game now, and keep explaining it. I've kind of gone over the gist of it, though. Oh, one last thing I was saying. So the Bruiser, which is like a smaller tank with more damage, their main role is to kill these minions because usually most Bruisers in this game are built to quickly clear waves of minions. If you clear a wave of minions, which I'll show you, they're these things right here. They're running out from every lane right here, right here, right here. If you clear those minions quickly, the enemy's minions, your minions will push and begin doing damage to their turrets and their wall and then eventually their fort and then eventually this wall and then eventually their keep and then their core. So if you kill their minions faster than their minions are killing their your minions or if they have a teammate who fails to clear these minions and get an experience for their team, your minions will begin pushing. Now as you can see they respond, they want to get the experience too. I'm going to go here and clear this wave. But basically, I pick a bruiser. One of the easiest ways to climb up the ranks towards master and grandmaster in this game is to efficiently soak. Soaking is killing the minions fast and efficient. That's what soaking is. Double soaking is a term used for someone who is soaking one wave and then immediately goes to another wave and kills that. And generally spends most of the game going back and forth, back and forth, occasionally rotating, which means like going towards your team, rotating to a team fight, where everyone's fighting, and also trying to stay alive and not get ambushed or ganked. Ganked is kind of like, not really an ambush, but it's when you get flanked while you're trying to soak or something. Generally, a lot of players in this game are not very efficient with how they soak, and so if you can soak well without dying, you can climb to a pretty high rank in this game. I took a ton of damage from an ability from their Li Ming. It happens, but... I got health and mana from this well. Now I have two minutes before I can use that well again. I'm gonna take a siege camp here. A siege camp will push like the minions, it'll push with the minions and help push the lane more strongly. I'm gonna fast forward this. We're gonna, it's gonna take a while before the things really start to pick up. Oh yeah, so anyway, as I was, actually I forgot to say, so their composition had the general tank bruiser two assassins healer. Our comp has three bruisers and two damages. No tank, no healer. Unconventional and generally worse. We managed to win this game because I used good strategy, which is essentially my strategy is using my abilities to kill these minions faster and uh, put the macro pressure on their side. We actually get very behind in this game and we lose a lot of forts. We get down to one keep, just this one. But I have a, uh, another ability which helps, I have two other abilities which help me to protect defensively and increase our offense as well. So every player has three to four abilities, but at level 10 they get a heroic ability. In League of Legends they're known as ultimates, or call, people call them ults. An ultimate is an ability that has usually between a minute or two minutes or even more than two minutes in its cooldown time, and it usually does a ton of damage or does something extremely effective. So everyone has their gen gen general generic abilities, but then they get their ultimate or their heroic at level 10. And then at level 20, they get to upgrade their heroic again, make it even stronger. My hero has a heroic that will send out something called a lava wave. The lava wave will run down a, a lane that I pick and it will kill all the minions and give me the experience from the minions. If I time it correctly, I can get as many minions as possible because I know the times that a new minion wave spawns. And it will allow me to push a wave with my minions, collect their experience without actually being in the lane. And because of that, my wave will push that side and one of their players will be forced to go and deal with that. If they choose to neglect it, I will win a fort, eventually a keep, and eventually their core. Or so if they don't deal with it, that's what will happen. Or they go and deal with it, 
which will force one of their players to leave a team fight and it will turn it into a five versus four where we have five players fighting and they only have four because the one is dealing with my minions because of my lava wave so it's very um it gives a big edge from a macro perspective and i've already kind of established that even though most players aren't aware of it the macro is really how you win these games i just use an ability there where uh, i can take over a fort i kind of have two ults actually this hero he doesn't have two ults but he has a trait which is like a bonus fourth ability, which is kind of like an ult, where I take over a fort, or a heroic, sorry. I take over a fort, and I have a huge range on my abilities, and I also prevent the fort from taking damage while I'm protecting it, because it becomes me instead of the fort. So, and it lasts for a little, a short amount of time, but also, and it also has a finite amount of health, but it can protect the fort in a pinch. I just died right there. Anyway, I'm going to speed it up faster. As you see, we're fighting over an objective. Actually, I'm going to slow it down. Whoever gets to 100% without the enemy team standing on this objective right here, it will drop a big mech down. And then two of their players can get in the mech and begin pushing a wave. And it does a ton of damage to like structures and forts. So it's ideal to try to win objectives, but again, it's not necessary. There's, there's several ways to skin a cat. So even though my team's going to do a lot of fighting there and I'm going to try my best to, uh, to win it, um, uh, like, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought. As, I'm going to do my best to win it w whether or not we get the objective. We lost this objective. Uh, I'm going to try to help us win objectives, but I'm also going to be prepared that in case we lose the objectives, because I don't have a lot of control over whether my teammates die or not. I have a little bit. I'm going to try to do things to protect against that. As you can see, I used my Lava Wave. It pushed, killed all their minions, gave me the experience. Now he has to deal with my minions and he doesn't have any of his minions help, helping him until another wave spawns and begins moving. So every two minutes I'm going to send out a uh, wave. Now I'm using my trait also which is the thing where I take over a fort. I protected their this fort from being destroyed by that mech. It lost a lot of health but I prevented it from dying. Once a fort dies the enemy's lane or minion wave in that lane every third wave will have an extra mage at the back of it, or an extra minion, which is an artillery. It'll be like kind of like a a trebuchet of, so, of sorts. It, it'll fling like catapult shots that do a lot of siege damage to their structures. Anyway, now I'm gonna speed it up. So now you get the basic premise. We're fighting, but also while these people are distracted by a lot of fighting, I'm trying to kind of behind the scenes outpace their bruiser in doing um, siege damage and killing minions and macro pressure. I made a mistake there and died. I kind of mispositioned. Um, but they got a counter kill, so it, it's even, basically. Um, doesn't matter a whole lot. My team didn't. I tried to get them to deal with this, but we're going to lose this fort because he cleared the wave and now the minions are pushing. They didn't respond to it quickly enough. And he actually was willing to die in order to take out that fort because he can respawn, but that fort can't respawn. So he made a smart calculation, which was that it's worth him dying if he gets a few last bits of damage to kill that fort. Because now we have a disadvantage in this lane. And as you can see, there is the siege minion that's you know shooting little catapult shots. So every third wave now has one of those. If they manage to kill this keep without losing a fort, every single one of their waves in this lane will have one of those now. I've sped it up. There's all this stuff going on. Don't worry about that. This might look confusing I'm in, on high speed, but it's just a team fight. They're fighting, they have their camp, and their minions pushing, all that. Now, they're up here, but again, I'm over here doing the grunt work, the actual heavy lifting that wins the game. See how he and I, while all this is going on, we're, we've got our own little war here of who can be more efficient at, um, and he's trying to kill me, but who can be more efficient as at um, trying to get these waves and stuff. The advantage I have over him is I have this lava wave thing. Whereas he has to go and manually clear every wave of minions in every lane, I can use that to clear the waves. It also does damage. So let's say we get caught in a team fight with them and I happen to time a wave correctly and they stand in it, it will do a ton of damage and most likely get multiple kills. That's what I was trying to do there. It didn't work, but at least their minions aren't pushing now. So at least we're not getting attacked by minions as well. So we have these minions, and you can see the minions, they don't do a ton of damage, but they're helping us in the fight. But they don't have their minions because they're not going to, you know, they're waiting for the next one to spawn. Now, as you can see, I'm, I know that they're going to win this objective because it's at 80%. We have two people dead. 
they're gonna get their mech gonna get the mech they're gonna get the support i know this more already dead so what did i do i quickly went away and began focusing on where else can i get value right so i'm it's kind of a cutting my loss type thing i know this is lost i'm gonna go try to get value where i still can i'm not gonna you know defend something that i can't save i'm gonna go focus on what i can protect and where i can push an advantage because i'm doing that this guy is forced to also keep soaking Meaning that instead of having five players pushing against us here, they only have four. Two of them are in the mech. That makes it less threatening to us. They're a level ahead because a lot of my teammates have died, but my lava wave makes it so that I can more efficiently soak than him. So even though they're more ahead on experience because of kills, if I'm diligent enough at soaking, getting my clearing the waves myself, plus using lava wave, I will eventually catch up and outpace them. Especially because at level 20, I can get a second lava wave. So every two minutes, I will get one charge of a lava wave. I can store up to two charges. So at level 20, I can have two lava waves, which means I can eff effectively completely clear two wave, two lanes. And since every two minutes I can do that, I'm going to be very effective at keeping the pressure off of my side and increasing the pressure on their side. As you can see, there goes the lava wave. This thing is the reason I pick, pick this hero, because I can more efficiently, through small, gradual pieces at a time, as you see that wave had just spawned and I got it just as it was spawning, so my timing was correct. Because of that, that's how I win. I pl play this hero purely because of his macro advantages. I can safely push a wave without risking being too deep on their side and getting killed or ambushed or ganked. And so I can manage the macro while I'm still helping out my team and fighting. So I can actually, most bruisers can double soak. Like they can quickly kill this wave. And then if I wanted to, I could go quickly kill this wave. And then maybe kill the third wave, but some maps are bigger. With lava wave though, I can effectively triple soak because I can kill two waves myself. And then I can use the lava wave on the third lane. And after level 20, it's even easier because I could technically use a wave on two lanes and just focus on the one lane myself and then also help out with team fights. So this, this hero has a big, big advantage. Um, and yeah, so now this camp pushing, but I have to wait 44 seconds for my lava wave to be up again. But now I'm gonna speed up. So you get the basic premise of this game, as I've kind of detailed it. And really it's just, even though it's like, they, they're doing all the fun fighting, like trying to get be good at fighting and stuff. I'm doing really the tedious, less fun stuff, but the stuff that actually wins. As you can see, they had three players there against R2, and they were going to try to finish off this fort. I used my trade again, took over the base, protected it from getting damaged. They only did a little bit of damage to it. I run out of time on it, but the base is still there. Then I lava wave. So now that they've retreated from this lane, I'm also going to put pressure on their side of the lane. So while all this is going on again, now they're in trouble down here, and they're going to have to send someone to deal with it their tank decided to go deal with it because he's a decent player and understands the important to some degree he understands the macro importance he's also standing still right here so i think he was typing to his team saying like why aren't you guys clearing bot because generally the tank shouldn't be clearing off lanes. generally the tank wants to stay near the middle of the map in the mid lane and protect that so he's probably mad at see it looks like they're typing to each other when they pause for a second that you can tell teams are usually arguing. That's good. You want p players to be getting angry at each other on the other team because it causes discoordination, they lose focus, blah, 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 blah. The tank was probably mad that I was pressuring the macro and they, these guys weren't doing anything about it. Because the damages can clear lanes decently and the bruiser can clear them really well. But the tank is a little bit slow. That tank can do it pretty decently well, but he's still not the most efficient hero to be using for it. As you can see, I sent another wave top. Now I'm in, my wave's pushing. So this whole time, while I'm playing like a normal hero, I've got this added thing of I continually keep hammering their side with this stuff where they have to keep going to deal with it. If they're not efficient and highly skilled and good players, they will slowly lose. As you can see, they're probably gonna lose this fort right here. They eventually just said fuck it and decided to lose the fort because they've got we've got an objective that's on the other side of the map so it is what it is. Eventually they will lose. See, so I'm basically exploiting an inefficiency in their play. Now, unfortunately, we lost a player, so they died. So we did get a fort, but, you know, they got a kill in response. So 
they're gonna, probably going to win the objective again and get our fort, which is less than ideal. I'm going to speed it up two times, so this might look confusing, but that's not really what's important. I know that we've got one dead, so what am I doing? I'm killing this siege camp so that it'll push the lane. I've recruited it now by defeating it. And guess what? I've got a lava wave. I'm going to wait for the right timing. I'm going to have this with this pushing, and then I'm going to lava wave. Watch. It's going to come right now. They win the objective. They're pushing bottom, but I've got this camp and this wave pushing top. So with sped up speed, you're gonna, it's going to show that it, does it's, it doesn't do damage this quickly, but it shows that it's pretty effective, right? I've got, a, I've got this artillery minion, and I've got these uh, camp, and then another wave comes to join them, defeats the other wave easily, begins pushing it. Now, one of their characters went to go deal with it because he knows that they're about to lose this. I took about a third of its health just because they passively didn't respond to it fast enough. And I didn't have to do anything other than press an ability in the right lane. So this is a very easy hero to climb with strategically. Anyway, we lost a hero though. This guy kept foolishly dying. He made a lot of mistakes throughout the game. Yeah, it's his seventh death. And it's costing us a lot. So that what they see that we've got 30 seconds before he's up again, they're going to try to pick away at this and destroy it. What I'm going to do is use my trait and a lava wave. They think we're weak. I'm going to show them that we're strong. Art of War. We, we appear weak. I'm going to get them at the last second. Oh, no, actually, I, no, I didn't use the trait yet. So they killed it. They killed that, but now they're weak. Look, their healer overextended. He's deep. He barely stays alive but we know they're in trouble. Even though they have five and we have four, their positioning and their health and their abilities are down, so they're weak. This guy, he's almost killing me, he's draining my health, but I quickly use my trait. Boom, I save myself from dying. Now we have a huge strength in this, in this area because I use these abilities. We actually ended up killing that guy who thought he was gonna kill me because I pulled that little stunt on him. Now I'm gonna do something called hearthing, which is just a faster way to get back to your core. If you channel it for long enough without getting attacked then you'll appear back here my health comes back look i sent a lava wave bottom so basically my diligent macro hammering is re relieving the pressure because we're seriously at a disadvantage here disadvantage we only have one keep left they've only lost one fort in 90 percent of the cases or more maybe 95 they are guaranteed to win on this game just by their advantage but because I'm being diligent with the macro, even though it's hard for me to get an advantage on their side, I'm buying us enough time by keeping the pressure off of us and keeping it towards the middle of the map or even towards their side of the map, even though we're way behind and their minions have an advantage because they have more of these things than we do. We're getting camps. I'm using my lava wave. It's keeping the pressure off of us. So I'm just buying enough time, hoping that we'll just win one lucky fight. If we can just win one lucky fight now, we can easily win the game because the mech will be very strong and we can just push it in for the win, like, you know, getting a touchdown or whatever. We can just push right through their defense because our, our mech's strong. Look, I sent another lava wave because I'm level 20, so I use them every two minutes now. They're in trouble. This stuff is just going to keep pushing while I lava wave. I'm clearing this wave on my own. So while this is all going on, I'm being, I'm being very diligent, but also careful not to go too deep and get ambushed or, or ganked. I'm just basically trying to offset our disadvantage by pressuring them in other areas where they'll have to go deal with it. Their, their keep is in trouble. They do not want to lose a keep. Keeps are very valuable. They have to send a guy. Guess what that means? Five of us here, four of them there while this guy's dealing with it. So, and then he's got to deal with his other one. So they're feeling kind of, they're feeling pressured by my lava wave. Just because I keep using my ult at the right time, we're basically winning the game. It's very simple. But I also have to play this guy well because he's he's a decent team fighter, but he can die quickly. That's the offset about him. So I have to play really smart in the fights while also being diligent. Because if I die, I can't keep the pressure off of us. Look what happens. They made a mistake. We kill one. Kill two. Kill three. This guy, he's in trouble too. Guess what? I bought us enough time. We, I was gonna get in this, but then I realized, wait, I have to use my uh, abilities. So I'm gonna let another player get in this, a more vulnerable player, while I focus on the macro. We're gonna actually end top, so I should have lava wave top, but it doesn't really matter because we have a level 24 mech, four of them are dead. 
this last guy can't do much on his own, because if he goes too far out, we'll just kill him too, which makes him even more likely to lose. This thing has 96% health. I'm going to use my trait, pop up here. I'm hammering their core with my abilities. They've got a, we've got a mech. We've got all these players attacking. For some reason, so another player should have gotten the mech, but they didn't. But it doesn't really matter. There's nothing they can do. They've lost. So I took a game that had a probably, in most cases, we would have like a 10% chance of winning. I, I guarantee, almost guaranteed our win. All I needed was just one good play for my team. That was like really one of like maybe two or three good plays to that whole game. And the other two plays were very early in the game. I got zero kills in that game, but I got the MVP. My siege damage, which is damage to enemy structures and their minions, was over double their best player's siege. And my soak, which is killing minions, getting experience from minions, was over double their best player's. So eventually those lava waves, once I had two lava ways to store up eventually it just it got too much for them and that's why i play this hero that's why he's really good to climb with most players struggle with him because he's very difficult to fight with but you can just solve that by not fighting very much staying alive and just pushing your macro advantage it's really that simple so it doesn't matter what you do maybe you play chess Maybe you play Sudoku. Maybe you solve Rubik's Cubes. It's important to do something that's like some sort of logic puzzle, strategy game type thing that will push your brain to really work on being smart. Because if you do that, it will help your reasoning skills and your logic as you learn to trade. If I wasn't good at HOTS, if I wasn't good at some of the other strategy games and stuff that I play, it probably would have taken me a lot longer to... I might have never figured this out about the market, things that I'm telling you guys. Today, there was a decent short that I got. Um, well, I actually, I kind of cut it early because I wanted to go play that game, and I got a recording of that footage because I wanted to show you guys that game, how I win with Ragnaros. And I got a good game where we almost lost, but because of my diligence, I won. So I didn't really... I was planning on getting the short, but because I was in-game, I wouldn't have time to manage position, so I kind of had to cut it. But I was correct in what the position was going to be, which was that this big 4 p.m. candle, right as everyone's going to the close, big volume. So I see that it begins gapping down away from it. Not really, but then right here it does. The uh, So then market actually closes 4.59, but that's RTH close, I believe, or something like that. Um, I think that's options close. If No, actually, options close. I think that's a final options close. But anyway, there was high volume right at 4. Market closes at 4.59 or, you know, at 5. Opens again at 6. New York time. Trades up. Looks bullish. But look, only one candle even closes outside of that range. I just know it's coloring outside the lines. I take a short position there. And as you can see, goes down. Comes back up into that candle. Shorts away from it again. Comes away from it. Comes back up. Looks like it could short. Now it's starting to violate. Gaps up to the upside. My guess is that now it's kind of bullish. It may not give a massive upward, but you'll probably get a partial. Move your stop to break even at a one-to-one -one of this range, maybe, if you're lucky. And then you can catch a runner if you're lucky. If not, it'll violate it to the downside and then keep going down. Since then, though, there have been other candles that don't have as much volume because it's the night session. But as you can see, so I'm going to clear that one out. They're all interrelated, and it can get a little tricky and nuanced, obviously. It's not going to be a walk in the park, but see this candle right here? That one looks important to me. It gapped above it, or one above below it. Looks like a sell-off. Now remind you, this is a 15-second chart, so I haven't done a lot of trading on the 15-second. I just got the upgrade to premium for Cyber Monday for cheap, but it went below, failed. Now it's on the upside, so based on this candle, it looks like it probably wants to move up. And also it had violated that other candle to the upside. There's another big volume candle that's actually got a very similar range to it right here. So I would say whichever way it goes from this candle could be a very big indicator also of where price wants to go. Since it's in the same range, generally speaking, as that one, it will trade away, make an indication, come back, retrace, try to hunt stops, and then it'll go further. It'll probably hunt stops multiple times, which it tends to do. So, and the, but then eventually it'll start running. Once it's run far enough, you take a partial, move stop to break even. Simple strategy, analysis of it. 
It's a war, just like Heroes of the Storm is a war. It's a battle, You're fighting an opponent. So you just have to look at everything, uh, you know, everything strategic like that. And um, yeah, that's all I really got to say, guys. Take care.